everyone, Ariel Adams here, and I'm here with explorer Johan Ernst Nielsen. Johan, thanks for talking to me. Great being here. How does it feel to be on a break? It feels good. Um, I must say that the most important thing with having a break, sometimes the best way to continue is to stop. Because I just did like 17 days in a row without stopping every day, like 10 hours per day biking. And it really like, you know, your knees, your arms, everything gets so tired. So then you have to take like maybe four or five, six days of rest. So it's better to take maybe like, do maybe like 70 to 80 miles per day and then just like continue for a longer time. So you learn along the way. When you, when you take a break, you know, yeah. like what are some of the things you look forward to doing most? Um, you know, how do you sort of like regenerate mm -hmm. yourself? And this is really interesting. This is actually something that I came up with on this journey. I've done 30 expeditions in 100 countries, but every, every time I learn new stuff. So what I learned now on Everest and also on, on, on the North Pole to here is that before I was actually enjoying things to do. I was going to the opera, I was eating food, I was going to the theater, I was uh, uh, having dinner with a nice girl. All these things is something you do. Now I'm enjoying not to do. So which means that my luxury is not to do. So when I'm like not biking, my luxury is to relax, just sit and do nothing. So I don't have to bike 10 hours per day. I don't have to drag the sled in minus 40, 12 hours. So what I do on my rest day is that hopefully I will do nothing. Uh, just relaxing and just getting the, just the atmosphere in. But mostly I do like, you know, website updates, fixing bikes, uh, going to the doctor, fixing my knees. Uh, going through my wounds, you know, so, but a, a really good rest day is doing nothing. No, that makes a lot of sense. So right now you're traveling from the North Pole to the South Pole, is that right? Yes, yeah, correct. Right. Now that's a, that's a long journey. How far through your journey are you? Almost half. Oh. Uh, the equator is half, uh, half of the world. So I'm heading down to South America now. I'm uh, starting in, in, in a day or two from LA, biking down, and then uh, when I come in four months down to Chile, then I will uh, sail over to Antarctica and I will kite surf over the ice with the kite to the South Pole. I saw in a video you had this, um, this boat, this like, uh, kind of like one of those uh, inflatable boats attached to a hand glider. And the flying kind of, boat. The yeah. flying boat. Is, is that a popular way of getting around for you? No, it's not. Uh, I mean, for me it is, but uh, people actually think that I'm something from like, you know, from a cartoon or something. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to get like, you don't want to run out of gas 1,000 meters over Champs-Élysées in Paris, you know. It's actually, I'm flying like, you know, three, 4,000 meters, the highest. And it's actually like, you know, really scary sometimes. You have to be careful with it. Wow. But I really like the way of uh, tra traveling with it. What are some of your favorite modes of transportation? I know you try to be eco-friendly, so yeah. less engines are I think possible. bike is really good. Um, kayak is good. Kayak is complicated getting into a city. What are you going to do with the kayak? Are you going to leave it under a bridge or a bike you can bring with you? So a bike is a really good way of traveling. Um, it depends on if you're in, the, in an area where it's totally like, you know, with only nature or if it's an area where there's a lot of people around. Uh, if there's a lot of people around, I think bike is good. If not, uh, walking and hiking is always the best. Um, is, it, is it strange to do what you do in a populated area? Because it seems like you're, it's a little bit more comfortable if there's no one around. Because you can do what you want, you can look however you want. When you're in an area with people, yeah. is it strange for you? Yeah, sometimes, I, sometimes it's really, like, you know, really strange. You know, especially <laughs> getting, like, going down Ro Rodeo Drive. Like, you know, in, like, in a dirty t-shirt, like, you know, and, uh, like, not shaved for weeks and then just going with a dirty bike. You know, those kind of things are, like, you know, really. But then I try to, like, you know, take a rest for a few days in the big cities. And then just, like, you know, shave, take it easy, shower, and just, like, you know, try to get, like, nice clothes on to be able to get away from the, from, from the adventure. Um, you asked me about the rest days. And really, really good rest days also not to think about the biking just trying to take it away. Because then when I go back to the adventure again, then it's 100%. So which means that I will be biking 10, 12 hours. So which means that I will not be able to rest. So a good rest day is actually a day when I can just take away the whole uh, biking and the whole uh, adventure totally. Now you call yourself an explorer. And I was mm -hmm. thinking about this term because historically, this was someone who discovered new areas. But mm -hmm. today, the term explorer is different. So what is an explorer exactly today? Exploration today uh, is for me exploration within yourself. 
what I learned when I climbed a mountain, uh, like Mount Everest, for, for example, it's not new areas, it's not new geographical points. What I actually learn and what I teach in my lectures is also the discovery within yourself. What can the human body do? What can your mind do? I mean, you can visualize things, you can fantasize, but you never think that you can achieve it. But you can actually do that. So by doing these things, I'm actually learning the whole time how to explore my body and how to explore myself. So I have a new expedition coming out after I've done the seven summits, the highest point on all the seven continents. My next expedition is called the Eight Summit, Exploration Within. It's 100 days with a Tibetan monk in a monastery learning meditation. So what I learned on the seven summits is that the exploration is inside and not a geographical point. So I do also uh, exploration within as much as exploration uh, geographically. So what do you think people can learn about themselves when they do these inner explorations? Well, I mean, first of all, if we start with the, uh, with the geographical points, is that when you climb a mountain, for example, I take a lot of clients climb, for example, Kilimanjaro. What they do is that they learn how to work in team, they learn how to be unselfish, how to support other people, how to be able... To, some like you know, leaders from big companies, they never like ask for help. But there they are, they have to ask for help by somebody else. And they're not used to that, so that's kind of like, you know, that make, they makes them grow. So I think that also by going inside yourself and, 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 and setting up a, like a goal at the top of a mountain and then reach that, then you can actually apply that to other things in life, that you can actually achieve almost anything that you set your mind to. That makes a lot of sense. You've probably had some pretty dangerous situations in all of your expeditions. Have you had dangerous situations with local people, or someone didn't like you doing something, or you ran into someone hostile? Oh yeah. How do you, do, how do you uh, deal with that situation? People have been shouting words to me that it even makes me blush, you know? <laughs> so I mean, going down small villages in Canada and US, people walk with sticks at night, screaming bad things, go with cars. If you go through, if you go through LA, um, if you go through LA, um, the wrong part. Or if you pass New York, the wrong part. If you go through Bronx or whatever, if you go... I mean, some parts you don't want to bike at night. So, so the worst places you've been have been in like the US and Canada? <laughs> no, no, I mean the thing is that I started on the North Pole. Right. And listen, I haven't been passing by Mexico, Colombia and those places yet. Uh. And that is going to be a challenge. To bike, to bike with a bike with the Audi logo and you know with a Zenit watch and everything and then bike through Mexico and it's getting dark and I'm getting into a small Shishihuahua village, that's not good. So which means that in the US I can gamble, which means that if it turns out to be a little bit dark I can sleep under a tree and I can do that and it's not comfortable but it's not dangerous. Right. In Mexico I cannot do that. So, so what do you do? Where do you stay at night? In motels, but I will, I will not be staying in a tent next to the road right. in Mexico. Right. I can do that here. Okay, that, that makes sense. I mean, I can do that. I mean, even if, even if, if, even if it would be illegal, even if, if, if it would be uh, uncomfortable, it will still be doable. But in Mexico and Colombia, I would not do that at all. Right. That makes sense. So, so given all that, there's probably some essential things that you carry with you. You probably have to pack light, but what are some of your like essential tools, essential things you have to have with you all the time? It's like not, not negotiable. I have to have a leatherman. I have to have a tool. Um, I work with that all day. And it always comes up something that you need a knife for. So oh, I, I love my leatherman. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing is water, water bottles. Uh, you can never run out of water. You can run out of food. You can never run out of water. Uh, another thing is my computer. Uh, I'm updating websites. I'm working with that. I have the maps. I have everything with it. The solar panels and everything with it. Um, my cameras. My father actually asked me uh, the other day, he said, so Johan, what is the most important thing you have with you on an expedition? You know what I answered? What? Everything. everything. Because every little detail is thought through in detail. So which means that I cannot leave my dump jacket, I cannot leave my backpack, or my sled, or my tent, or my camera, or my cell phone, or my, my solar panels, or... I mean, all these things are as important. So which means that the only thing that I have with me is the things that I really, really... Then I have some luxury stuff, which is photos from the family, 
which is maybe some kind of extra chocolate in these small things. <laughs> and that makes life so much more fun when you go into your tent at night on the North Pole. And then, for example, you put on like, you know, your iPod. The iPod is so good because when you bike the whole day, if you're on small roads and it's not a lot of cars, you put on an audiobook, you listen to a book or you listen to some classical music or whatever. Right. Or it's just some, uh, some downloads of some uh, like, you know, Saturday night shows, whatever. You just listen to it. And it makes time back go so much faster than if you just like, you know, just without music, just thinking about things the whole time. So that's what you do when you get bored. You have, you have an iPod to keep you occupied. Yeah, yeah. I listen, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Now I listen to a book of Dalai Lama. I just listen to the 127 hours, whatever, the guy who cut off his arm. You know? Right, right. Yeah, so I listen to these kind of books. And I listen to like, well, it takes two, two days, one book. So, I mean, I'm reading like three, four books per week. When do you do that? Right, exactly. Yeah, but I do that meanwhile I'm biking. So I'm exercising, I'm seeing the nature, and I'm reading a lot of books. It's, it's some people would call it a luxurious lifestyle. It could, well, I mean, if, <laughs> if you bike 100 miles per day, and if you're like, you know, dirty, sleep and tense, and you break your knees, and you bleed, and you have frostbites, everything, that's not luxury. <laughs> But, but it's a lot of points in the adventure that is actually really interesting. Uh, and I'm, I like the everyday, like the small luxury part, to be able to sleep comfortable, to be able to eat good. What has kept you doing this for as long as you have been? You said you've been on 30, at least 30 yeah. different expeditions. How, what, what keeps you doing this? Because I'm sure that after 5 or 10, you're like, okay, I can do something else now. But you've done this many... Um, I've heard that you're thinking about stopping sometime soon. Mm. What keeps you going with all this? Curiosity. Uh, I'm very curious. Uh, people, uh, cultures, nature. What can I do? How can I inspire other people? How can I work with my motivational speeches and do my lectures? And how can I bring people on my adventures? I do, for example, with six children who have cancer every year. So now I brought 17 children who are 30 years old. Uh, up to the highest mountain in Sweden, 2,000 meters, 6,000 6, feet, something. And, and, and these things keep me going, uh, to work with other people, but also how far can I put my own limits? I think that's interesting. And just because I will stop with my big adventures, one, it doesn't mean that I will stop doing the adventures. I mean, the, I mean, the eight summit, for example, the 100 days in, in Tibet, that's kind of like you know, a shorter expedition, um, what I mean with I will stop with the big ones is that I will not do like the six month or one year expeditions anymore. I want to have a family. I want to find a girlfriend. I want to like you know get married and have kids. I don't have that. I'm 42 years old. I want to have because that's also an adventure, and that's also a part of life. So you have different stages of, in your life. This is one. I've been doing 20 years now of uh, of adventures. Okay, so fine, basta. Now I have something else to focus on. Now you've been like all over the world, you've yeah. seen different lifestyles, you've di seen different people, and that's an experience most people don't have. So yeah. having seen all that, where would you want to live? If you could live out any of these places, where would you want to reside permanently? Where I'm happy. And where are you happy? Uh, I mean, wherever I lay my hat, that's my home, I like all expression, but, but you know, wherever I'm happy, so, we, so, so that changes also. I mean, let's say that I find a girl in Colombia and uh, I really like, you know, she lives there and uh, that's her life and maybe I'm happy there with her. Or maybe I'm happy in LA doing something else here. So it changes all the time, but I don't think I can ever, never ever live in one place. <laughs> and, I mean, I have an apartment in Dubai, I live in Stockholm, uh, I'm working a lot in New York, I was a TV host in, in Shanghai, in China. So I'm traveling the whole time, you know, I'm traveling the whole time. So you're flexible, you can live many places. Yeah, I do at least 120, uh, 180, 200 days per year traveling. Now you have a couple of important sponsors. Yeah. And you know, working with you is cool because you do a lot of interesting things, they get their name out. Um, when working with the sponsors, what kind of things do they want from me? What kind of questions do they have that, that uh, you may not, may not be obvious to people? Yeah. Well, in the beginning, for, for example, it was all based on, on, on logotypes. You're going like, to you know, show Audis and these different things. Nowadays, as you see, I don't sit with logotypes. Uh, but I'm a proud ambassador, so which means that I work in a different way. I, work, I build up the company in, in terms of, um, uh, like internally, uh, in the magazines, like, like the Audi magazine, the Zenit. So I work with them in a different way. So I give lectures 
all over the world. I do my TV stories, I do all these kind of things. Then they can use it in advertising. They can use it. Because the thing is that if you overbrand it too much, if you try to sit like you know in every angle, just show logo type of thing, it loses a little bit the the, the serious part of it. It, it. it becomes a little bit ridiculous if you overdo it too much. Like a race car driver. A little bit. Yeah. So 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 which means that uh, of course, it, when I'm on the North Pole, when I'm on the bike, you know, I have my logos, I do my, my things, everything. But like I was sitting in NBC News, now I'm invited to Conan O'Brien and, and people think, oh, there you going to see all your logos. No, I'm not. Because it would just, it, it will, but I will talk about the brands that I work with uh, and they can use it, they can put it on their website saying that, hey, our ambassador is Conan O'Brien. These kind of things. So I think that in the long run, it will build up a brand, a more serious version of it if you don't overdo it in terms of like, you know, if you don't overexpose it. That makes sense. Now, I, I write about watches and yeah. Zenith is one of your ambassadors. Yeah. You're wearing a Zenith watch right yes. now. Uh, you know, in what you do mm. when you're out exploring, how important is a watch? How important is it to have a good watch? And what are some of the features that mm. are more, most important to you? In a watch, I have a lecture called The Importance of Time. Uh, if you're going to climb Mount Everest, it's very important to be on time. Which means that if you are like one hour late, you have to cancel the whole expedition, which means that you won't reach the top. So the time when you go to the North Pole, uh, you have to calculate with the sun, with the time. You know that at two o'clock, the sun will be there. At five o'clock, the sun will be there. So you have to look at the time, look at the sun, and then you have to calculate. So which means that the time is very, very important. And then all, you have different things also. If you're going to cook food, if you're going to do all these kind of things, melt food or thing, you have like, you know, you do the time, you check the time, you have like, you know, these kind of things. But then also, you have to use also the watch for uh, security in terms of the watch can actually be used. If you lose the GPS and everything, you can find your way, you, 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 can, you can navigate your way home with the, with the watch. So for me, it's important that it's light, it's important that it's very, very rough that I don't have to like, you know, be worried about if it's going to break or not. And then it's also important, it has a different thing also, it's, it's, it's also the branding behind it. I mean, Amundsen used it 100 years ago to go into the South Pole. Now I'm using it again 100 years later. It makes me proud. I'm, I mean, it's, I like you know, quality and I, it's, for me it's very important to have a history behind it. Were you into watches before working with Zenith? Oh yeah, I've been a collector for 20 years. Yeah. Okay, so then it was an easy thing. It was an easy thing and it also, I mean, there were so many brands contacting me and there were so many brands that I, that I also talked to. But Zenith was interesting because, you know, first of all, I mean, I mean they started with, with El Primero in 1969. They were doing like, you know, the inside of like the Daytona watches. So, I mean, they were like, you know, and they have been a really interesting growing, uh, they're one of the like, you know, top, top, top uh, brands in the world in terms of the inside of the watch. So, I mean, they are really exclusive, but in a rough way. Right. Uh, then they have the exclusive parts that, that to be on all these kind of things also. But for me, it was important also what it stands for, uh, the people around it, uh, the, the group down in Geneva, everything, and the people and their energy behind it that I really love. But also that Amundsen had it 100 years ago. And that's cool. Now, I see you have a special strap on the watch. I have a special it's... strap. I mean, leather will, I mean, it will smell like hell after like, you know, six months on, on the road. So this is... Uh, this is a different strap. So uh, is that the strap you use when you're uh, you're yeah. out exploring? This is actually, I think, this is the first time I take the watch off. Actually, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so what does this little red uh, string mean? Does that have special? Uh, this is this is um, this is um, a Buddhist. Okay. Yeah, from uh, from a monk who did it for me. Yeah. And it's on the watch. That's nice. Yeah, it's. Um, I have I have a lot of things that is uh, like close. Uh, a lot of like you know charms that is uh, mean that means a lot to me. Yeah. So if you could if you could make a special watch. Mm -hmm. Zenith can make you a unique watch. It mm -hmm. had some other feature that would be particularly useful to you, other than the chronograph and the time. What would it be that this watch could do that maybe would, would help you a little bit more? Um, a few things that was important to me was the, what do you call it, the fluorization, you call it? The luminance? Yeah, the, yeah, the luminance, uh, but like when it's dark. Right. That is really strong, because, you know, otherwise, you know, I can't see it, like, you know, when it's, when it's dark. In the tent, so that was important to me. Uh, that is something that I have. Um, uh, the timer is important to me. Um, 
uh, I actually think that I have everything that I need on this watch. Uh, maybe maybe a second time, maybe like you know, maybe a, like a second uh, if you want to have like another world time, maybe. I right. Uh, I haven't thought about it, but um, to me, this has been like you know, one hundred percent for what I need now. Maybe if I'm going to die, maybe if I'm going out of space or whatever, you know, maybe I will need some other feature, then we will discuss that. But uh, for this expedition, this is, it's actually totally custom made for my needs. Yeah. That, so, that's, that's totally cool. Yeah. And it's very light. Do you ever consider yourself a survivalist? Because there's all these people that are survivalists, there's explorers, different things like that. Mm. Do people ever like try to categorize you and you say, no, that's not what I am on this other thing? So how would you describe a survivalist? So survivalist, there's you know there's all these television shows and yeah. things like that where someone will go out in the wild and uh, be in what they call a survival situation mm -hmm. where they have to survive for maybe a certain amount of days with with yeah. not having anything on them using the stuff in the land. Do you use do you use the environment around you to help oh, yeah. survive? Oh yeah, you, no, okay. no, I, I I do totally. But if you would put me out in the desert, I don't think that I would actually manage how to. Like you know, eat the drink the blood out of snakes and eat the snakes. <laughs> and, I mean, if you would put me there, let's say next year, I would uh, learn how to do that. But now I cannot do do that. And uh, you know, there are some points. In, I must say that these guys on like this survival thing, they are very, very, very knowledge. But I think it's a lot of setup also. That yeah. You're gonna be there. You're gonna live out of those like herbs and things. I was walking across Alaska in '95, uh, 1,000 kilometers, and I was like living out of fish blueberries and uh, mushrooms and the, but I must say that we were sitting with this me and my friend Nicholas we were sitting with this uh, book about the mushrooms is that that mushroom I'm not really <laughs> sure the other one looks the same it's very dangerous so I mean, you have to have some kind of knowledge also you can't just like go wild and say like I know everything knowledge is number one before everything you do everything all the expeditions that, that you actually do knowledge is the number one preparation planning and knowledge when there's people that want to do what you do, especially children, and they ask advice on how can I do what you do, what kind of things do you tell them? Well, first of all, you have to do it for yourself, not for somebody else. Uh, a lot of people say like, oh, I would love to do that because that is cool. Well, you have to do it because you like it, you know, because you, you, you love the environment around it. I love this uh, thing that's coming up now, geocaching. You, you heard, you heard yeah. yeah, I actually been doing that a, 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 a few times now for a Swedish organization, and I didn't really know about it before. But when I was a kid, we were like you know playing hide and seek, you know, and playing pirates of the Caribbean, these kind of things, or cowboys and Indians, and you were out playing. Nowadays, people sit in front of the TV, they watch TV shows, they play Nintendo, like a game and watch these kind of things. So people are not really out in the wild, and if they do sports, they just do a sport. Uh, but they don't really experience the, ex the exploration around it. So this geocaching is actually really interesting because then, first of all, you learn how, how to navigate, you learn how to think logical, you learn how, how to find, and also you mix technology with, with outdoor. So people are running around with the iPhone, find these things out in the forest. It's actually pretty cool. I, I actually like that way of... I think children are sitting in front, in, sitting in front of the TV much too much. And I think that being out is very important. So for me, I would say that um, it's very important that you... S People say that, oh my God, you know, you climb Everest. Well, I climbed this like Mount Whitney. Well, I can't even talk about it because it's so embarrassing in front of you. Listen, we all have, we all start somewhere. We all have done X, Y, you know, amount of things. You know, I started like, you know, 95 with my first climb. And that was nothing compared to like the, my last climb. But you have to start somewhere. And if you say that I won't start, you know, I, oh, I won't go to the gym because I'm too fat. Well, you're going to stay too fat if you never go to the gym. So I mean, it's really cool to see people actually. I mean, I saw this guy jogging down the street now that he was really, really big. That was really cool to see this guy is like, hey, I don't give. You know, I just I want to do this. I'm proud of myself. I'm going to work this out. Right. So, so I mean, I think it's important to actually don't care about if you don't know it. Do it anyway, and you will start to, to learn it. Now you said you wanted to start a family and find yeah, a girl yeah. and things. It, is it at all important to you that she can do these things, wants to do these things? Or I don't you want to. Different type of life. I don't want her to be even close to what to what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you know, uh, I, but I want her to be an individual. I want her to be a character. I mean, it has to be somebody who's like, if she's collecting stamps, that's her thing. That's cool. I don't really care about stamps, but if that's what she likes, 
that is cool and I will support her. Even if she doesn't make any money out of it, if that's what she's burning for, do it. So I mean, um, I like somebody who has goals and dreams and visions. You said that when you're done with all this, you want to write some books about what you've done. Is well, I'm true? doing that the whole time now. I have two books that I'm working on now. So, what 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 is the, sort of some of the messages that you want to get out of these books, or maybe in future mm -hmm. books? Um, the the one that's coming out now is the next one is is it's called the answer is yes. And the name of the book is based on everything is possible, and it's based on 20 expeditions. It's based on 20 problems, 20 solutions by thinking outside the box. So let me give you an example of a chapter. So this um, uh, lock system, you know, the locks when you when you go with boats through countries, you have locks. Right. You know. So we have 400 locks going through Europe with the kayak. I was kayaking from Stockholm to Africa in 96. So it took me six months, like eight hours every day for six months to travel with my kayak, with my sea kayak. So I come to this city of Nordhorn in Germany, between Germany and Holland. So I stop there and um, there's no water because they just closed down the lock system. So I asked this old man, so how can you travel, how can you kayak through the city? No, it's not possible. Of course it's possible, it has to be somewhere. No, it's impossible. Let's just for a moment pretend that it would be possible. Well, I can't because it's impossible. But let's just make believe that it would be possible. Then how would you do it? Well, if it would be possible, which is not, but if it would be possible, then I guess I would have chosen the sewers under the city. Call up the fire department, open up the gates, take down the kayak in the tunnels, and a kayak in the tunnels under the city, getting out on the other side, this old man standing there looking at me, and I say, hey, you see, it was possible. Yeah, if you think like that. Exactly. So, by thinking different, you can actually make the, pos the impossible possible. So, he was so narrow-minded, thinking that it's impossible, so he didn't even give it a chance. So, by putting him in the corner, saying that, let's just make believe that it would be possible. Then he opens up the gates in his mind and starts thinking about angles, like, if it would be possible, then how would I do it? So, so those 20 chapters in the book is based on problems and solutions by thinking differently. Well, that, that sounds pretty cool. So, how much longer do you have in this particular expedition? When's the planned finish date? Half a year. So, six more months and then, yeah. and then you're done. Yeah. Is it six Yeah, it's six months. It's a long one, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's going to be a long time. And then you're going to be flown back. They're going to pick you up somewhere. Yeah, then I will do what we talked about earlier. Nothing. <laughs> I will take some time. I will shut off my phone. I will shut off my internet. And I will just go to some kind of island in the Caribbean for like two weeks and not answer anything. And just lay down and just relax. That, that sounds a good plan. So where can people go right now? If they want to track your journey, see what yeah. you're doing, and pull more to pull.net. Pull to pull.net. Yeah, we did too. Yeah. Johan, thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure's mine.